everyone. So thank you for being there. We'll try to start on time just to make sure we're not compromising the next event. Uh, thank you for coming here. So the name of the side event was basically agriculture uh, about um, how to address industrial food systems, uh, compensation and food security. So what is beyond the world of agriculture within UNFCCC negotiations? Um, the main idea was uh, to, I would say, to, to go further on what has been discussed last week during the negotiations. Uh, unfortunately, the negotiations just ended on a new status quo uh, this last week, so we thought we would have really more good news on substar negotiations. So basically what we are trying to do today uh, for the side event is to, to try to catch up a bit on what happened last week on mitigation and adaptation divide that does exist between EU and G77 plus China. I don't know if you were part of those negotiations or if you had any feedback, but just to say that EU made a proposal about how to talk about agriculture in terms of adaptation and mitigation, whilst uh, G77 and China presented another draft talking only about adaptation in agriculture. And this has remained a, a blockage until the end of the week, and they finally decided to delay next uh, um, negotiations and discussion to next year, which is according to us and to uh, our organization. So uh, CCFD Terre Solidaire, Action Against Hunger, and CITSE, which is absolutely not acceptable uh, when we know that climate change is causing a, a growing food insecurity. According to the last figures of the uh, United Nations, uh, between 35 and 122 million people will um, will be in um, poverty uh, and mainly because of uh, low uh, agricultural incomes. So this is something we can not accept and it is really important to try to overcome issues on agriculture within UNFCCC and this is why also today we are going to talk a little bit about this mitigation adaptation divide, trying to have three different presentations. So my name is Anne Laure. I work for CCL Data Solida. I will be moderating, of course, this uh, side event. But our first uh, presentation will be uh, done by Mary Britton Richards, which is a CGRA science officer on the research program on climate change, agriculture, and food security. So she will try to address uh, non CO2 permanent emissions in agriculture. And, uh, and I think she, she will give us a, a very good uh, overview uh, on this uh, aspect and try to, to talk a little bit about uh, the mitigation aspect. Uh, then the idea is to, to try to, to tackle what we do want in terms of mitigation agriculture and what we don't want in terms of mitigation in agriculture. So this is also why the second panelist will talk us about carbon, soil carbon sequestration uh, in and carbon markets. So her name is Kelsey Perlman and she's a policy officer on land use and aviation for Carbon Market Watch. And finally, uh, trying to address the second main topic of agriculture, which is adaptation, because you all know that even if agriculture is one of the main uh, greenhouse gases emission sector, uh, the small scale farmers are also the first victims of climate change impacts. So we will talk about adaptation and how um, uh, Action Against Hunger is considering adaptation under uh, this topic. Uh, so it will be Bertrand Noiret from Action Against Hunger, who is an um, agronomist specialized in sustainable food systems and advocacy officer on food security and climate change. So we'll start with uh, Mary Britton Richards. Thank you, Anne Lauren, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak on this uh, panel side event. I'm going to be talking about uh, mitigation potential from agriculture for non CO2 greenhouse gas emissions, as Anne Lauren mentioned. So, this is, these are statistics that are probably familiar to most of you, um, if not all of you. Uh, so, the agriculture sec sector contributes about 12% of global greenhouse gas emissions about slightly less than the transport industry and about twice the building industry, the building sector. And uh, forestry and other land use contributes an additional 12% um, of global greenhouse gas emissions. About 70% of those are agriculture related. So within that forestry and other land use, about 70% of those emissions are related to deforestation due to agricultural expansion. 
Within the agriculture emissions, and these are just non-CO2 emissions, the majority are from enteric fermentation um, with smaller proportions from manure left on pastures, synthetic fertilizers, paddy rice, manure management, savanna burning, and a category of other emissions. So that gives you a scope for, or an idea of what current emissions look like. Uh, but when talking about future mitigation and, and mitigation targets for the future, really the more important uh, aspect to consider is what future agricultural emissions will look like going into, you know, all the way out to 2100. So models, these are um, scenarios of mitigation out to 2100 show that due to really um, ambitious targets or ambitious assumptions about the energy sector in particular having negative emissions, by uh, around 2050, agriculture, in agricultural emissions, methane and nitrous oxide, will comprise the bulk of, um, of global emissions. If we don't mitigate from agriculture, what it means is that mitigation from other sectors in order to meet the two degree target that has been set and, and especially to meet the 1.5 degree target that we're aiming for will be more expensive because those emissions will have to be compensated for by reduced emissions in other sectors. So the question that um, uh, myself and colleagues at CCAFs, in particular, this work was led by Lini Wallenberg, um, set out to answer towards late last year was how much do we actually need to mitigate from agriculture in order to meet this, the two degree target. This was prior the, the 1.5 degree target. And what we found is that in order to meet this target, the agriculture sector would need to reduce methane and nitrous oxide emissions by about one gigaton per year by 2030. So the, this is an annual reduction, not a cumulative reduction but we would need to be gradually ramping up the reduction to the point by 2030, we're reducing one gigaton per year. This would mean that agriculture would need to limit its emissions to about six to eight gigaton equivalents. Now there's plenty of uncertainty around this figure, but um, to calculate this, we looked at three different models that implemented the two degree scenario, and they were all around the, um, around the area of one degree of, of mitigation in 2030. So that sort of leads us to the next question, which is how are we going to achieve this? And there are, there are many different ways to look at mitigation potential and in what systems it could happen and, in, and how it could happen and where it could happen. Um, one way to look at, look at it is by looking at current emissions, which gives you an idea more or less of where the emissions are coming from. And if we wanna look at it from a responsibility standpoint, standpoint, what countries might be responsible for those emissions. So if we look at just, uh, agricultural emissions, um, again, just methane and nitrous oxide emissions, about 39% of agricultural emissions come from four countries, China, India, Brazil, and the US. And this is based on their reports to the UNFCCC. The, the countries with the most emissions tend to be those where you have a lot of livestock or you have a lot of um, a large amount of fertilizer use or a lot of flooded paddy rice. This is, so those are the three main contributors. If you look at it in terms of agricultural emissions per capita, it looks significantly different. So here you have countries with large, um, large populations, such as China, for example, um, their emissions per capita actually look fairly low. And this is sort of one way at getting at the idea of emissions intensity or emissions per unit of food produced. Obviously, you know, we're not this is not directly talking about emission intensity, which is fairly difficult to calculate due to the diversity of food products and, and attributing emissions to particular food products. But if you're looking at you know, emissions that are produced to feed a country's population, this is sort of one way of looking at it. You can also look at it in terms of mitigation potential um, or sort of where emissions are coming from in particular sectors. So this map shows greenhouse gas emissions from livestock systems. In this case, we're not just talking about methane and nitrous oxide. This encompasses emissions from um, feed production and from land use change as well. Um, but here you can see that you, know, you have certain pockets where these, where, that are really driving the emissions from livestock se sectors, um, particularly areas like in, um, in the Amazon and Brazil where you have deforestation, although that's um, abating somewhat. These emissions are from, or estimates are from 2005, um, and where you have a high concentration, just a high concentration of livestock, such as in the Midwestern U.S., parts of India, Europe, and China. 
Um, so I don't know how, how familiar some of you are with livestock systems, but some of the ways that you can reduce emissions from livestock systems, um, I mean, first of all, you reduce the number of livestock. This tends to be a very politically unpopular opinion. Um, and it's not, because of that reason, it's not accounted for in a lot of estimates of mitigation potential in the livestock sector. But I'll talk about that a little later on. Um, there are also interventions such as um, improved breeding. Um, you can uh, improve the feeding of livestock, for example, uh, feeding more uh, higher quality forage or feed. Uh, and then there are also in things like methane inhibitors um, that can be fed to livestock that actually reduce the amount of methane that they produce. There's also the issue of manure management. So um, things like anaerobic fermentation, uh, better using manure as a nutrient source, are all uh, interventions that can reduce the reduce emissions from livestock systems. There's also the the potential for nutrient management. So, as many of you, many of you probably know, um, nitrogen containing fertilizers, regardless of where the nitrogen comes from, are a source of nitrous oxide emissions, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. This map shows the nitrogen balance on the landscape. So in other words, it gives you an idea of where there's potential to reduce emissions by more efficient use of nitrogen fertilizers. So again, we have some of the same hotspots, Europe, um, areas of India, China, and the US. Um, in parts of Africa, uh, farmers are actually mining nutrients from the soil. So there could be potential for um, actually increasing uh, use of fertilizers without increasing emissions. So taking all of this together, um, and then what I didn't show you is the potential in the rice sector, which more or less um, corresponds directly to areas of flooded paddy rice with good water management. So a little bit of bad news before I get to some more hopeful news. The Taking all of these together, the potential for reducing non-CO2 emissions from the agriculture sector is about 0.4 gigatons of CO2 equivalents per year. Now, if you remember back to my second slide, what we need to achieve is about one gigaton of mitigation per year. But so this estimate is using, is using only practices and options that we know of right now and practices and options that don't involve structural changes in the way that food is produced. So in other words, we're not shifting where food is produced, we're not reducing numbers of animals. And the reason that we use some of these estimates is because they're sort of the best estimates that are considered compatible with food security. So in other words, we're not doing anything that would actually reduce the quantity of any type of food produced. So how are we going to meet this one gigaton target? Um, well, to start with, scientists are working on some what we like to think of as or call blue sky technical options. So things that aren't available now, that, but that may become available in the future and that aren't accounted for in those mitigation potentials that I showed you earlier. Uh, one is the idea of reduced methane cows, so actually breeding animals to produce less methane, uh, less enteric methane. Now, I'm not going to lie, until maybe a couple months ago, I thought this was a crazy idea and it, you know, could probably never work. Um, but there are actually some new studies coming out that show that you might be able to reduce methane between 5 and 20 percent. But this would be out, you know, maybe 20 years of science or so. And what hasn't been looked at yet is what would be, or scientists are looking at but isn't yet known is what would be the implications in terms of animal health and productivity and what would be the trade-offs um, if, if you're breeding for methane. Another example is crops that actually inhibit the production of nitrous oxide. Uh, for example, there are some species of forage grass that are in the Brachiaria family that naturally inhibit um, nitrification in the soil and so reduce nitrous oxide production. Uh, so that's an option that is that Brachiaria grass is actually used currently in, in parts of Colombia and Latin America. Um, and it, there's attempts to actually breed that trait into crops as well. There's also the question of demand side options. And so this is where you get into um, question, or options that tend to be a little bit unpopular. I'll start with the more popular option, which is avoid food loss and waste. And this is a, an area with huge potential, um, both in developed countries where you have issues of food waste, partic um, tend to be post-consumer uh, food waste, and in developing countries where you have food loss. So in other words, due to lack of refrigeration or lack of storage, you know, food is uh, wasted before it even gets to the consumer. 
and this could reduce about 0.79 to 2 gigatons per year. Now, it's important to note we can't really compare this figure to the one gigaton goal that we have because this has to do with the entire life cycle of emissions and also includes deforestation emissions. So we haven't yet figured out of that one gigaton, that one gigaton of methane and nitrous oxide, um, what's the implication of food loss and waste just for that, those emissions in particular. There's also the issue of dietary change, especially reduced meat consumption. Um, and so a couple of modeling efforts a few years ago looked at the implication for several different uh, types of diets. Uh, one was just looking at reduced meat consumption in Europe. One was looking at a shift to what's considered a healthy diet. So a sort of a more balance of um, plant sources of protein with animal sources of protein. And this could reduce about 0.1 to 1.37 gigatons per year. Again, that is entire that that has that's off flu emissions so it's not just methane and nitrous oxide emissions from agriculture so how much of that would contribute to the one gigaton is still an unknown um, question there are also emissions elsewhere within the food system now it's it's we can't really sort of claim these within the agriculture sector because within ipcc reporting guidelines these fall into industry and energy and transport so these are sort of considered outside the food sector outside the agriculture sector, but they're part of the food system and structural changes in, in food systems, like we're talking about you know, changes in meat consumption or different diets could also impact these emissions as well. So sort of adding up emissions from fertilizer and pesticide production, feed production, refrigeration, retail, et cetera, the emissions, so this is not the mitigation potential, just the emissions is about 2.3 gigatons. And to my knowledge, there's there's sort of research going on to how to reduce those, but we don't really yet know the mitigation potential there. And lastly, and this is sort of to provide a segue to Kelsey's presentation, is the question about carbon sequestration. Um, these are the potentials that are shown up there are mitigation potentials um, on croplands, grazing lands, and agroforestry. Again, these are mitigation potentials on existing lands. So the, there's no land use change involved in these, just by the implementation of practices that could increase carbon sequestration in soils, and in the case of agroforestry, tree biomass. And so the potential there is fairly large. Now, the question is, how much of that could compensate for um, methane and nitrous oxide emissions from agriculture, for non-CO2 emissions? Or, and should we even attempt to do that? We don't know. Uh, but one thing we do know is that carbon sequestration in soils is one of the mitigation options that is most compatible with food security. So if you're increasing carbon in soils, generally that has a positive impact on, on ecosystem function and, and also on productivity over the long term. Um, and also in many cases, it's essential for um, sort of bringing farmers out of a rut of low productivity, particularly in um, unproductive soils in areas of Africa. So I'll leave it there and pass it off to Kelsey. Thank you. All right. Can everybody hear me well? Okay, that's better. Hi everyone, I'm Kelsey Perlman. I work for Carbon Market Watch. I am a policy officer uh, on aviation and land use activities as it relates to the discussion around carbon markets, which is often quite a tricky uh, subject to wrap our heads around. And um, it's, it's particularly interesting in this debate around agriculture, um, following up on the previous presentation, because we've seen that the mitigation potential in non-CO2 sectors is only 0.4. We need to go farther. And so the question around offsetting um, comes into play. We need to make sure that we go beyond 0.4 gigatons of mitigation, which means we also have to go beyond compensating methane, continued methane emissions, continued nitrous oxide emissions, and uh, moving away from the idea of uh, using sequestration to allow business as usual uh, in the agriculture sector. 
So um, I think it's it's worth having a kind of brief 101 on on offsetting. Um, offsetting allows governments, individuals, uh, businesses to compensate their carbon footprint by purchasing emissions reductions or carbon credits, as they're often known, um, from projects in other sectors around the globe. Um, now that we've seen all states taking emissions reduction pledges, we've seen that continued offsetting into the future is not viable for staying on any type of trajectory going towards 1.5. Um, so we're seeing a lot of initiatives around soil carbon sequestration, which are incredibly necessary, um, but they are toying with the idea uh, of jumping into offsetting, um, whereby they can sell those credits either to other groups in the agricultural sector or other sectors such as aviation so that um, continued trajectories of, of pollution can continue. So, so situating sequestration in the climate effort. Um, we've seen the, from the AR5 IPCC report that global temperature increases of about four degrees or more above late 20th century levels combined with increasing food demand, sorry, you guys are not with me, there we go, um, would pose very large risks to food security globally um, with a very high confidence of that assertion. As we've seen from uh, many different analyses that have gone on, that we are on a pathway of three to four degrees with the current NDCs that we have now. Um, we've already discussed that non-CO2 GHG emissions from agriculture, I'm taking the 2010 number, are about 10 to 12 percent of global anthropogenic emissions, and those are going to need to be reduced. But it plays into a larger conversation um, around negative emissions. So negative emissions also includes terrestrial sequestration, so forestry or the soil um, absorbing carbon. And we realize that these need to be employed on top of and not replace um, emissions cuts in the sector. So we no longer have a budget for carbon offsetting and negative emissions, which are already being employed now, um, are used as kind of a bet for um, emissions pathways that have already overshot a two degree scenario. So I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the difficulties of crediting carbon sequestration activities. A carbon credit needs to represent one ton of CO2 reductions. That means that measurement of the reductions needs to be certain, it must be additional to business as usual, and it needs to be permanent. So no chance of that uh, reduction being re-emitted to the atmosphere um, on an incredibly long time scale, such as those that are offered by fossil fuels. Um, the sequestration activities pose the following difficulties. Um, input data that is necessary to estimate uh, greenhouse gas reductions globally and regionally for sequestration. So the Lulu CF sector, land use, land use change in forestry generally, are often based on country level statistics and they're very, very uncertain. Um, the Joint Research Council um, of the European Commission has come out with a very nice study looking at uh, the very high uncertainty levels for measuring Lulu CF in nationally determined contributions. So we already know that even just for measurements of NDCs, we're looking at a massive amount of uncertainty. Um, also additionality, so making sure that um, actions that we're crediting are man-made. Um, there has not been a very reliable method of separating uh, human-induced change from natural uh, greenhouse gas fluxes in the, in the land. So a nice example of that is um, if you are do doing forest management, um, where do you draw the line between what is a human-induced impact, a positive impact, and where do you draw the line that it's just also nature doing its job as a forest? So what the IPCC has proposed are proxy measures um, where they'll just draw lines around certain plots of land and say these we're going to assume are, um, are basically man-managed and then other lands, we're just going to assume that it's just natural effects and that's how they decide uh, what is additional and, and what is not additional. And finally, and it's a, it's a very hot topic of the UNFCCC negotiations, are accounting rules that are then applied on top of measurement of land uh, for compliance. So uh, to be able to kind of talk everyone through some of the difficult accounting tricks um, that you can see in the UNFCCC framework, I thought that we would go through a certain example. So you have three types of accounting. Um, you have net-net accounting, you have forest management reference levels, and you have gross net accounting. So the example that I'm putting forward here 
is uh, assuming that a country A has a sink of 10 megatons and that they have put forward a projection, projected decline in their sink uh, where they would arrive at eight megatons, but in reality, their actual emissions reductions, uh, they end up growing their sink and they arrive at 13 megatons. So depending on what accounting rules you apply, you end up getting a different amount of credits that could potentially go towards a target or could potentially go towards producing offset credits, uh, which could then compensate for, for emissions elsewhere. So it's important to get this correct. Under net net accounting, you would see that they would take the difference between emissions in 1990 levels and compare them to the actual emissions that were achieved in 2016. Um, this is the most honest form of accounting and you would be left with only uh, three megatons of a positive credit that could be either generating offsets or, or going towards targets. Under gross net accounting, uh, you would just calculate the size of your sink in the year that it's achieved. So here you would be credited with 13 megatons, even though your sink in the past uh, only grew by three megatons. And finally, if you're using uh, a business as usual forest management reference level, you're going to look at your projected emissions, which is eight megatons, and you're gonna compare it to um, the actual achievement and credit five megatons um, instead of comparing it to historical data on your sinks. Um, so this is a eye-opening uh, understanding about the, the very difficult accounting that exists right now in the land use sector that provides quite a heavy obstacle um, towards credibly crediting these types of sequestration activities. So I, I'm now going to look at an example of how um, agricultural mitigation is conceived using the European Union example. In uh, Europe, their legislation separates uh, sequestration efforts in the agricultural sector and uh, nitrous oxide and methane emissions. So the graph that you see on the right, uh, you can see emissions from agriculture that are around uh, the 500 megatons of CO2 equivalent. And then you can also look at the sequestration activities under land use, land use change and forestry. You can see that the EU has a net sink. And if, uh, if you folded land use change and agriculture together, you would have uh, very little emissions uh, and it would look like agriculture had absolutely nothing to do to, rele to reduce its carbon footprint. Um, so this is, this is kind of a way of visualizing how sequestration can be used to, to reduce the amount of effort that a certain sector might have to achieve. So the non-CO2 regulations treated under the effort sharing regulation with other sectors such as transport and buildings, and the CO2 is treated under the LULUCF regulation. That being said, there is a political battle on the ground uh, around uh, the agricultural sectors of various countries looking to be able to count some of the sequestration efforts in land use, land use change and forestry um, towards what they need to achieve under agriculture. And this is referred to as the LULUCF loophole, um, which we are looking at now. So the LULUCF proposal has recently come out um, and the proposal allows for a compromise for states that have very high agricultural emissions. So uh, for those who cannot reduce their emissions, there has now been uh, the option of using 280 megatons of credits from sequestration activities uh, that could then be used towards what the agricultural sector should achieve all on its own uh, underneath the effort sharing regulation. So we can see that this actually impacts the overall climate target put forward by the EU. Uh, which is supposed to be a 40 percent uh, reduction of emissions uh, by 2030 and uh, as you can see those 280 million tons eventually impact the target reducing it from 40 percent to 38.5 percent of co2 emission reductions that will actually be achieved instead of keeping the land use sector separate and adding on top of all of the needed mitigation in sector so there are some lessons that we can draw um, for the Article 6 discussions and the wider discussions on carbon markets and specifically carbon offsetting. Um, sequestration needs to be treated separately so that it doesn't undermine decarbonization efforts or as the case with uh, methane and nitrous oxide, just reduction of emissions that are direly needed to be able to reach 1.5.
So, so in conclusion, uh, the sequestration activities are, are frequently being used to overshadow the need for, for rapid decarbonization. Um, this is the case in the aviation sector, and it's also the case in the agricultural sector. And if we're seeing many different sectors saying that we can't reach our targets, and we need to be able to draw from, from sequestration, then, then we're going to be very, very far away from reaching 1.5. So once again, this is another reiteration that there is no more budget for continuing offsetting. Um, additionally, the, the AFALU sector has many objectives. Uh, we wanna make sure that the land remains healthy, um, that food security is a top pri priority, that we're protecting local livelihoods. And this really does go beyond the central focus of, of what carbon markets are expected to do, and that's pure mitigation. So, uh, you know, I think that with the con we need to conceptualize the dealing with agriculture a little bit differently, and we need to flip the model. Um, so, so we do need to be looking at um, mitigation as a co-benefit of adaptation. So Article 4.7 of the Paris Agreement talks about mitigation co-benefits resulting from parties' adaptation actions can also be counted towards their pledges. Um, so the, the mitigation aspect won't disappear if we are putting an emphasis on, on adaptation. And that would also mean treating agriculture under 6.8, which would be non-market measures, which looks at more holistic approaches of, of reducing emissions uh, in the agricultural sector, as well as others. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelsey. Uh, we're going to flip a little bit and talk about adaptation now. Um, so, Action Contre la Faim, Action Against Hunger, it's a French NGO, and we are dedicated to, to fight against malnutrition, especially children malnutrition. And in these actions, we are also working on agriculture as a main as a root cause of malnutrition in many places. And so, as a humanitarian NGO, uh, what, what is our main concern about climate change is all the, its impacts on the population. So whether it's uh, loss of rain in some places, uh, dry, uh, droughts, uh, problems on agriculture, submersion, uh, hurricanes, typhoons, etc. And for action against hunger, the, the particular concern is on food security. So. Just to explain it quickly, because it's it's very often reduced to production of food and agriculture. Uh, food security has an agreed definition since uh, 20 years now, which is uh, being it's it the state when you have access to uh, sufficient food to have a healthy life. If I reduce it, so it means there's a there's three pillars equivalently. Uh, with all the same weight, and also uh, the stability. So availability means that there's enough production. Uh, everybody can have, uh, there's enough production, there's enough uh, food intake. There's the access, which is more about poverty. So you have financial access to the food, but you also have the physical access to it. There's a quality pillar, which is about diverse, diverse food, nutritious food, uh, safe food, and also the state of the person with, who eats, so which is in a good health. And this should be stable all along the years, all along the year, all along the years uh, for everybody. So climate change actually does not only impact food production, but it impacts all these pillars of food security. So I here just give some uh, different study, re recent studies about this and how it impacts different, different parts of food security. So, of course, if you look back in the 2007-2014 IPCC reports, you have all about the loss of productivity, the loss of the destruction of crops, the changes in pests and uh, disease that can affect the crops. 
uh, you can very easily find also the, the risks related to desertification, soil intrusion, submersion, which will all impact agriculture. Um, and then on the access pillars is very interesting literature from yesterday, from last year from the World Bank, uh, Shockwaves, which shows how climate change impacts uh, poverty and drives uh, more people into poverty every year. And this year, they, they published a number of 26 billion people pushing poverty every year. So it's a direct impact on the access to food and then food security by this way. And then on the qualities, there's many, uh, many different ways it can be affected. So the reduced vegetable and fruit availability per capita, so it's linked to production, but then it means that there's less fruit and vegetable available per person in the in uh, 280 uh, 2080 sorry uh, which will have an impact on 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 health very direct and an increase of uh, about 500,000 deaths per year uh, there's uh, an increased risk of aflatoxins so uh, aflatoxins are a toxin due to some fungi in the especially into cereal production and which is really bad for health. And there's uh, other studies uh, showing that the increase of temperature or the increase of uh, CO2, uh, CO2 um, pressure in the air, pressure pressure, would reduce protein contents, uh, iron and, and zinc content on, on a lot of productions. So this is just to show how food security is at threat because of climate change and why we, we really focus on, on, on this. Uh, just some, so just one map to show the, the impact on climate change on productivity, showing, showing uh, it's a main impact in all the inter, intertropical area and also in aridic areas. So the African continent will be mostly affected by the impact of climate change, but also also huge part of the US, Central America, uh, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and uh, Australia, as you can see on the map. So it's not, uh, there's no divide between developed countries that will be all safe from it and developing countries would, would be all affected from it. It's gonna, it's gonna impact everybody. And if you see the, the state of food and agriculture from the FAO published just a month ago, um, it's, it says that until 2030, there will be some parts of the world which will have maybe positive effects from climate change on agricultural production. But after 2030, the, the impacts will be bad everywhere if there's no adaptation. In fact, this impact on productivity will impact also the price of uh, staple foods. So here you have uh, different scenarios. So the price in 2000, the price, uh, an evaluation of price in 2050, if, it, if there was no climate change, or just saying about the increase of population, the increased need uh, for, for staple foods. And, and then choose a scenario with climate change, which so that there, there is a, a net increase of food prices. And this is also a source of food insecurity, as I uh, explained at the very beginning. So big numbers, uh, according to the IPCC report in 2007, 600 more people would be, uh, 600 million, sorry, more people would be affected or uh, suffering from hunger in 2080. There's about 800 million uh, these years. 50% of the world population could be at risk of food insecurity by 2050. And if we look at uh, our particular topic at Action Against Hunger, uh, 20 to 50 more children could be stunted uh, by 2050. So there's a real need uh, for adaptation in agriculture to be sure that it ensures world food security. So who should adapt and how? Uh, today, most of the world food production is produced by small scale farmers, so it's 50, uh, 70 to 80% of uh, world food production. 
and the farmers, and especially small-scale food producers, they are the first victim of climate change. I mean, they are the the one who, who are facing most shocks and who have the less capacity to face this, these shocks. So adaptation efforts should primarily focus on these small-scale food products. Small, uh, sorry, small scale, small scale <laughs> food producers and uh, practices should uh, help them increase their resilience in face in the in face of shocks, increase their autonomy, and increase the efficiency of the resources that they need to produce their food. According to Action Contre la Faim, agroecology is the only way to get all this done. I mean, agroecology is, uh, um, is a model that promotes ecosystem-based adaptation, uh, ecosystem services, good, good soil health, um, reduced use of uh, chemical inputs, and locally seeds and breeds, and indigenous knowledge. So locally adapted knowledge um, is fundamental. And agroecology is also a, a social and political movement uh, aiming at building farmers' autonomy, social rights, and really, really taking into account the three, the three criteria, social, economical, and environmental. And uh, according many, many, many reports, and the, including the FAO, agroecology agro can sustainably feed the world. So there shouldn't be really a debate on can it or can it not feed the world. So I just want to present some of the results from the last report of the uh, International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food System. We were expecting to, to get somebody from the panel to, to, to present it, but unfortunately it's not possible. So they released a very interesting report in May uh, called From University to Diversity, a, Parad a Paradigm Shift from Industrial Agriculture to Diversified Agroecological Systems. And it's in fact, uh, talks about adaptation and also about mitigation, but we'll focus on the adaptation side. Organic uh, crop systems are often qualified to be producing less, uh, less productive, uh, and they're often criticized for that. But in fact, if you give the time to change the, the cropping system, to make it organic and build the ecosystem services. After 30 years, conventional and organic, and organic yields are equivalent. And on the other hand, it also increases the resilience. The study that is presented uh, on this graph shows that uh, if the this, if, if the conventional and uh, organic yield of maize in a normal year are equivalent, when there's a drought, the organic production is higher because the system is more resilient to the drought. So it's, it's, this is where you can see direct impacts of organic, uh, of the shift to organic system on adaptation in agriculture. Going from university to diversity so an agroecological approach is really about uh, creating virtual cycles, virtuous cycles uh, with the, this strengthening of ecosystem health and um, diversified agroecological practices and biodiversity, etc. So it's, it's not about shifting it just in once to, to a totally different uh, system, but it's really a way of transition to uh, resilience, autonomy, and uh, efficient use of resources. Moreover, uh, adaptation through agroecology is this, is just is not sorry it's not just uh, ensuring. Uh, uh, food security in the long term, but it also has many co-benefits. So first of all, as you produce with a lot of biodiversity, the crops and the varieties that you have in your field will be more or less affected by the, any climate shock that you can face. That means that you have less risk of having a total crop failure 
and loss of income. As, uh, as you save resources, when I mean you save water, so you can use less water in case of you have, uh, you're in, a, in an area with uh, a lot of uh, unpredictability in the, in the rains, but it also protects the soil from erosion. As it focuses on labor, human labor, no mechanization, no fossil fuels, uh, less, chemical, less or no chemical impacts, uh, inputs, you, you create more need for labor and labor force. So it's a source of employment in rural areas. It's also, at, as it uses uh, very little chemicals or no chemicals, it's better for the environment and it's better for the health of the communities, of the farmers, Uh, the crop, the higher crop diversity uh, means there is more diverse food available, and so it's very good for nutrition too. And at last, as you base everything on the health of the soil and its biodiversity, it means you give organic matter to the soil, and the, the organic, uh, the content of organic matter in the soil should be increased, which means somehow carbon sequestration. So just to say, finance should be made available for adaptation in agriculture, through peace and agroecology, if we really want to ensure food security for all. This implies capacity transfer, knowledge building, research, and experience sharing. South, south, north, south, north, north, everywhere. And as food security is a foundation of development, it's one of the sustainable development goals, SDG2. It's also a basis for stability and security. So it should be made, adaptation through agroecology should really be made a priority for climate finance. I'd like to say some, some warnings about the false, so-called false solutions. So according to us, uh, wealth food security won't be achieved if you don't tackle the problem of poor and vulnerable uh, risk. In, in, uh, in front of food insecurity. Uh, if you just increase, uh, if you promote solution which increase uh, inputs with high technology, biotechnology, et cetera, you're not tackling the poorest. You're tackling those who can afford it. And it's certainly not the 70 or 80% of small scale producers around the world. If you produce more in certain areas, okay, you have more food but you won't tackle the problem of inequitable distribution of food around the world. And the fact that today, in our countries, we are producing to feed 12 billion people, but there's still 800 million people that are suffering from hunger. So it's not a problem of just producing more because in some areas they produce less. It's really about adapting everywhere, well, everywhere so people can produce their food and achieve food security and even food sovereignty. The, there's, there are many global initiatives that are trying to uh, increase productivity or adapt to climate change, but most of these initiatives, they don't have a clear framework, they don't have criteria to work, and they, they just, for the moment, are communication uh, initiatives and trying to channel a lot of money from climate finance, uh, if we take the triple A from uh, carbon sequestration, if, you, if we take the four per mil, uh, uh, cat per mil, and, um, and, uh, and they just don't have sometimes just no criteria and everybody can join if you look at the GAXA initiative. So uh, to conclude, uh, ecosystem-based adaptation through agroecology is the key to ensure food security as climate change impacts agriculture. There's a, an extra word in this sentence. Therefore, therefore, adaptation should be financed and must first and, for, and foremost build resilience of the poor and the most vulnerable farmers. Ecosystem-based adaptation in agriculture also brings a wide range of co-benefits. And I also want to add that uh, this is only possible if we stay under the two degree target. So anyhow, there must be uh, huge emission cuts from the agricultural system where it 
where it is uh, emitting a lot of uh, nitrous, uh, nitrous oxide and, and methane in particular. So this is a, an, a little uh, schema from the IPS food report, where you see the transition from subsistence, ag subsistence agriculture to diversified, diversified agroecology farmer on one side, and the other side, the transition from agri uh, industrial agriculture to agroecological diversified farming. And this could sum up the debate there is today about on one side, it's really about financing adaptation to go for a more resilient system. And this has a lot of mitigation co-benefits. And on the other side, it's about reducing our emissions. So really mitigation and having strong mitigation policies to do that. And it brings adaptation co-benefits. Because if farmers in France begin to diversify the wheat, maybe they they will have, uh, they would be more resilient to the kind of impact that they had this year with a, a, climate, a climate incident uh, that, that, that reduces 30% of our production. So it's, it shouldn't be separated because the idea of adaptation uh, of climate action here is to ensure food security, world food security. And so the divide there is now between adaptation and mitigation on agriculture uh, discussion should not occur as it is. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists. It was really interesting and very rich. I uh, will try to have a very, very quick summarize of this. Uh, the long term goal there is a need for non CO2 mitigation. Um, obviously, there is a potential for 0 0.4 gigaton but we are looking for a one gigaton uh, objective. So we need to, to improve that. So mitigation is also about questioning food systems, but there is a lack of research right now on this. Uh, what has been said also is that there is no more budget for offsetting and that it can't replace emissions cuts, that sequestration activities are uncertain. There is difficulties in terms of accounting, and this is also why it's an obstacle to link them to carbon markets and market mechanism. Uh, the example of the EU has been given also how uh, LULUCF for land use and land use change and forestry is used um, uh, to offset uh, and undermining climate target in terms of reduction of emission and that carbon sequestration should be seen only as a co-benefit of adaptation and could be considered under the Article 6.8, which is a non-market approaches. Uh, we also had a key point on food production that is not food security. It's only one pillar of food security, which should be um, uh, tackled also as the food security is recognized in the Paris Agreement preamble. Um, also, that food security issue is a worldwide concern and not a divide between the north and south uh, divide. Uh, I was quite surprised all the maps that we have seen that it was not a question of EU against G77 plus China, but more about something about uh, models of agriculture and uh, and uh, how to 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 address uh, what you said. That one was more about uh, food security, models of agriculture, how mitigation and adaptation co-benefits could also be adaptation and mitigation co-benefits, and how we should maybe overcome this divide. And also, you, you mentioned the focus on small-scale farmers that are the first victims of uh, climate change impacts in terms of adaptation. And uh, I, I would finalize with this uh, agroecology shift uh, that could uh, answer both of, uh, of, of concerns in terms of mitigation and, and uh, adaptation with a wide range of uh, co-benefits. Uh, so I would like now to open the floor to questions, uh, if there is any. and. Uh, if you can introduce yourself and, uh, and if you want to, to address to someone specifically, please uh, indicate it. Yes, I don't know if, do we have a mic or? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Olya, I'm from National Ecological Center of Ukraine and I probably have a question for uh, both of you, for all of us, maybe, I don't know, whoever answers it. So, uh, question is as follows. Um, if we reduce uh, livestock and uh, if we reduce consume, uh, consuming meat, uh, I know it sounds shocking, but still, 
won't it um, won't it help us to resolve two problems at once? Like, um, so we um, we will help. It will help prevent climate change. Thus, it will have uh, less um, uh, effect on these um, on these places where uh, where like which are affected by climate change. Yes. And the second problem that will be solved is uh, basically we will have more space to grow food for people, not for animals. So it's simple, but I just want to know your opinion on this. <laughs> yes. Maybe we'll take like three questions and then answer it. Is that okay for you? Yes. Um, Natalie Bennett here with the Green Economics Institute. Uh, my question is probably to the last speaker, but really to anyone who wants to answer it, because I'm very concerned about, and I understand the need to bring the agroecology models on small scale diverse farming in the developing world in the global south. But I'm really interested if anyone, and indeed anyone from the audience, knows of good schemes to really make it work in the global north. I mean, my favourite thing to talk about in this area is talking about restoring the ring of market gardens around British towns and cities. Now, virtually no British fruit and a very large amount of British vegetables are not come from, they don't come from Britain, they come from the rest of the EU. But you might have noticed there's some impact relating to that and food security issues. So it's a question really of any good models anywhere from the developed world, where we're actually seeing the rollout on a commercial scale, not just one little sample study, commercial rollout of diverse agroecology systems in the developed world. Just to say to Manoj Kurian with the World Council of Churches Ecumenical Advocacy. Uh, Manoj Kurian uh, from the uh, Ecumenical Advocacy Alliance, which is the initiator of the World Council of Churches. Thank you very much for this uh, very good uh, discussion. You know the uh, about the about the about the you know especially livestock producing the the uh, uh, you know the uh, methane etc. The you have not covered probably it's out of the purview of the discussion it's uh, there's a lot of uh, the, the feed for the, the, the uh, of, of the of the you know the cattle is seed based and this is not what is uh, what is supposed to be it's grass based so what has happened is you know there has been studies from tufts university very clear study from the us how the whole uh, the the opening up of the seed uh, and, and, and and removing the protection and the and the reserves have led to a lot of fluctuation and, and the seed prices have been brought down and that has pressurized uh, you know meat uh, of livestock to be fed with seed based food you know so in the sense you know opening up and, and going back to pastures and then allowing uh, cattle to feed in the grasslands and it actually answers a lot of these issues so my question is about these market manipulations which is you know in in you know fiddling around with the, with seeds and food as a commodity is actually you know having a lot of influence, but it's not being addressed. And there are clear studies to show that. Even I'm talking about the US and the developed countries. So, you know, and trying to now fix it with the, you know, making cows which, you know, produce less methane by pumping it with, you know, stuff that it's not supposed to eat. And then, you know, and because of market manipulations for, for seed companies and you know, to make profits, you know, this is actually obscene. Who would like to start answering on reducing meat, maybe? Um, so the first question about uh, reducing livestock and meat consumption, solving or contributing to solving both climate change and, and space for growing food. I mean, the short answer is yes. I think it would, you know, it addresses both of those problems and that you, you know, release land from grazing areas or rangelands um, that could be used for, for food production or, you know, perhaps even for reforestation. Um, and then the, um, the, the last question about um, going um, seed companies and, and the need to, you know, sell grain seeds and, um, and how that's affecting the way that you know livestock are fed, um, you know I would agree that that you know that pro I'm sure there are, are market pressures that you know encourage industrial agriculture, particularly in the global north, 
um, and particularly using um, you know, grain feed rather than grass-based systems. But I would also caution against uh, you know, thinking that just returning you know, all livestock producing systems to grazing systems are necessarily going to solve uh, all of our problems because then you also get into an area where you're, you need land to graze those animals on. And particularly in the global north, a lot of that land is now forest. And so there is a trade-off between um, the intensity of livestock production and land use. Um, and so that's, that's also something that I think needs to be considered. I would say the, the question on uh, meat and the livestock and the question on agroecology in the north, uh, three kind of related because uh, they are really related to the level of sensitizing, sensitization from the population and how much they are ready to pay for, their, for the food that they have and the quality of their food and what kind of system they want to promote as consumers. And this is a, a bit far away from our talks for <laughs> this afternoon. <laughs> um, yeah. It just in France, there is uh, a law that allows uh, collect, uh, territorial collectivities to, to think about their policy for food and agriculture and what they want to develop at the local scale. And I don't know if it's uh, in other EU countries or not, but it could be a, a good option. If I could just, um, I'm kind of going a little bit off topic here, but to kind of illustrate some of the projects that are being put in place, um, looking to potentially generate offsets, um, you, you are seeing, um, you know, large agro-industrial groups that are looking to employ on a large scale no-till farming, and the fact that that would help uh, keep the soil in the land by not tilling it um, is a way that, that groups could look to generate carbon offsets. And, and, and this is the type of activity that we want to, to avoid because it's, it's not taking into account other areas of sustainability for the land. Um, you know, these, if, if groups are looking to deploy this in areas um, where there isn't farmable land that others have taken up, then you could see large scale land grabs because to, to be able to make sequestration pro projects profitable, it has to be done on a massive scale. So you see that there's no longer a, a real feasibility for making that work without having detrimental impacts or giving, you know, concentrating a lot of power uh, with, with a few people. Any other question? Okay, one, two, three. Hi, thanks. My name is Vineet Kumar from Center for Science and Environment. I just wanted your comments on, we are talking about agroecological farming. And on the other hand, we are also talking about climate smart agriculture, AAA, and tomorrow we have a big meeting. Here. So what do you think about like climate smart agriculture? What's the major difference in climate smart agriculture? Uh, which, as per your opinion, means if you look from the agroecological agric perspective, should not have been there. But because now, when I was looking at the Substa 44 meetings, so there are some common agricultural practices which different countries groups are giving their feedbacks, that so that they can understand that which are those common agricultural practices which can be like pushed forward for the negotiations. So there are practices like zero delays, no delays, and things like those things. So your comments on that. Thanks. My question is, uh, what do you think uh, uh, about uh, food sovereignty uh, versus uh, food security? Because as we know, food sovereignty is a higher level of uh, uh, eco or uh, ecological agriculture uh, integrity and diversity. Could you speak closer to the mic, please? Yes. Uh, food sovereignty versus uh, food security. Food sovereignty, uh, as we know, it's a higher level of uh, um, um, agricultural uh, integrity and uh, diversity, and as you said, uh, um, actually uh, much less uh, lower uh, external um, uh, 
production uh, imports uh, and more uh, food uh, independency and more self-sufficient, etc. Uh, this actually uh, yani arriving closer to food sovereignty, but food security, uh, some uh, international economical uh, uh, and financial institutions, uh, they uh, define uh, the same uh, as, you, as your definition, uh, food, uh, food security as uh, um, availability uh, and access and health food, uh, but not necessarily by local production. Because I, as I remember, uh, the minister of the American Minister of Agriculture, John Bolton, at that time, he uh, defined the food security exactly as I uh, mentioned, uh, that uh, uh, talking about uh, food uh, self-sufficiency or independency, according to John Bolton, it's uh, an old-fashioned uh, thing and uh, irrelevant to uh, yani, uh, our uh, uh, modern agricultural technology. So what do you think about uh, any of these two, uh, uh, and, uh, if you can say, agricultural schools? Thank you. I have one question too. Um, hi, my name is Caroline Wimberly from Brighter Green. I'm gonna piggyback on these two colleagues here a little bit to push on the, the topic of meat because um, you answered yes, like, reduction and it's controversial and it's not popular but as we've learned uh in the u.s popular opinion gave us this president that we're about to have so just saying something's not popular i think especially in these in these this space we need to talk about things and that PNAS study you referenced actually gave models for vegan and vegetarian diets and how much catastrophically more improvements and reductions in emissions and i know you might not want to use those words because those bring on you know, craziness, um, uh, and I and I, I know they're not popular in the in the policy world. But I think, why not have more attention and more work in that space to re reduction when it's so, I mean, in theory, very simple and doesn't involve twenty years of technology waiting for you know methane, less methane cows. Uh, Dennis Garrity, uh, senior fellow at the World Resources Institute and uh, World Agroforestry Center. And I want to congratulate you, um, the moderator, and, and the three panelists. I think we had some really superb presentations this afternoon. And um, I think that um, each of them brought out some important um, contexts of the issues and put together um, as they were, it's, it's a really nice holistic way of presenting the analyses. Now, um, just to reinforce uh, a couple of points, I think that uh, Bert uh, Bertrand's uh, presentation on the EFES report was, was an extremely important one because that report uh, came out a few months ago. It has not received enough attention uh, by any manner or means and I think we've got to get those messages out as you did so elegantly. And uh, I'd love to follow up with you on, uh, on, on doing that. Um, in, in the case of Kelsey, um, looking at the issue of, um, as you mentioned, uh, making a plea for in the developing world that we ought to be arguing for adaptation with um, mitigation co-benefits. One could also imagine, why not argue that um, globally, since, it, since everyone has to adapt to uh, climate change. But certainly in the developing world, that is the watchword. And that's where we're going to see the developing world contribute to mitigation. Carl was talking about simply because by really ramping up adaptation, there is the opportunity to ramp up um, um, uh, uh, mitigation. And that brings me to um, my question. Um, Meryl, you talked about the various ways in which we can reduce emissions in agriculture. You did mention agroforestry um, and a modest um, uh, estimate of what agro agroforestry could contribute. But a few months ago, a paper was published in Nature Climate Change that blew the whole analysis uh, to, 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 uh, to uh, shreds because we discovered that globally, um, 
trees already in agricultural land are accumulating carbon, uh, storing carbon at the rate of 200 uh, million tons of carbon per year, which is about 0.7 gigatons of CO2 uh, equivalent per year already, and it's increasing quite rapidly. So your, your numbers, uh, which were IPCC numbers, but they're going to be revised dramatically upwards with the new analysis. And it brings up the opportunity, Merrill, that when you look at these various ways in which modest uh, changes in emissions reductions are possible, if you look at what the ramping up of uh, agroforestry systems can do while contributing to smallholder um, uh, 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 food security and agroecology, it is amazing what uh, the future holds. Because if we're looking at adaptation with mitigation <clears throat> and looking at the ways in which trees in many, many different types of practices can be incorporated into agricultural land and are currently, um, then we have a whole new ball game, which I think um, needs a, a, a great deal of attention. I don't know if you're familiar with the work, Merrill, but I just want to ask you uh, if you were and if you had some thoughts on incorporating this into the analysis. Because there are, there are blue sky ideas out there that might work in 30 years, but millions upon millions of farmers are already developing agroforestry systems, some in the North, Europe, North America, as well as in the South, but right now, 43% of all agricultural land in the world, 2 billion hectares, has more than 10% tree cover. And my question is, how can we not take advantage of the opportunity to ramp that up to um, two or three or four times the rate at which trees are being used, perennializing agriculture that could could be a vastly greater contribution to, re to emissions reductions than all of the other uh, options that you mentioned. It, it, it doesn't require high tech. It's a low it's a low tech where millions of farmers can get involved, and it's adaptation with mitigation. So I, I I'd be interested in your comments on this because it draws all of these presentations together. Thank you. Uh, would like to start. I can, I can start. Um, so Dennis, is that the Zomer paper that you're referring to? So, Zomer, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so they actually did, the paper that I referenced that came out in June, um, uh, ECRAF and, and, you know, Ralph Summer and Zomer can, did contribute data to that, actually. The reason I didn't show it here is because we used um, Pete Smith's data, the IPCC data, to have sort of a consistent data set, um, you know, calculated in a similar way using similar geographic um, boundaries, et cetera. Um, but you're right that the, the potential for agroforestry systems is huge. And in fact, um, one of my colleagues who works within CCAS just published some case studies based on an analysis of USAID's Feed the Future projects. And these are projects that are, that are you know, obviously aimed at food security, had no mitigation component whatsoever. Um, and the potential that she found, particularly with agroforestry, as a co-benefit of you know, just good agricultural practices and you know, improving food security was huge. So you're, I agree that that's you know, a huge area of potential benefit. Um, Maybe I will, let's see, the responding, there are three other questions. Um, oh, first of all, having to do with, um, with reducing meat consumption. By saying that was politically unpopular, I did not at all mean to dismiss it. Um, I definitely agree that, you know, that's a huge potential solution. I don't eat beef myself, um, you know, particularly reducing consumption of beef um, and other ruminants. The, the reason uh, my organization doesn't work on it a lot currently, although it's an er area that we're looking into, is we're primarily a research organization, not necessarily an advocacy organization. So my, my charge to all of you who work more in the advocacy space is to make this less politically unpopular um, and you know, garner more support, particularly in, in the global north where meat consumption is highest. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there for now and let let my colleagues answer the other questions. 
Uh, thank you very much for the for the sorry for the intervention on agroforestry. Uh, it's a, it's free really key, and I fully support it. Uh, can't really go forward. Um, about agroecology and climate smart agriculture. Uh, climate smart agriculture has three pillars: increasing productivity, uh, promoting adaptation, and uh, mitigation and reducing emissions mitigation. But um, so we'll have different views with Mary, I think. <laughs> um, today, the CSA, the CSA concept and how it's used or promoted it encompasses too many agricultural models. So there is agroecology in it. There is very good projects. There is very virtuous ones. But there is also uh, fertilizers industry, biotechnology industries, and other big agro companies that are using climate smart agriculture vocabulary and that are promoting uh, things that are not responding to what I said before, that uh, they, are, they are not uh, responding to the inequitable uh, distribution of food production and food, uh, food access uh, over the world. They are not uh, always, uh, and especially when it, it's about using fertilizers, they are not uh, uh, environmentally uh, um, that they are not promoting environmental integrity, uh, and the and the, the the companies that are that are promoting it generally it's uh, Syngenta, Monsanto, uh, all the all the big ones. So for this, uh, as a, as an NGO uh, and as an actor who really wants to promote adaptation from the small scale for producer, I would say agroecology. Agroecology is the answer, and and we must be careful in in what we promote in terms of solutions. To quickly answer about food sovereignty, food security. So food security is very technical: uh, availability, access, quality, and stability around the time. But if we really want to promote uh, local adaptation and uh, food, and world food security. I would say we should go for food sovereignty, which is the right to, pro to, the right to produce and cho choose the food. Uh, maybe someone can speak better about food sovereignty, and I think uh, Anne-Laure maybe could take over on it. Yes, uh, I, I think the very added value of food sovereignty uh, compared to food security is uh, that people should have the choice to design themselves their models of consumption and production. And you can have food security without having food sovereignty because, as you said, like food security can be provided by uh, massive importations and not having like a sustainable uh, models of uh, consumption and production within your territory. So um, this is why my organization is talking only about food sovereignty uh, because we do think that people should be the one deciding for themselves and not being like um, um, crushed by uh, by commercial. Uh, treaties and, uh, and this kind of things and uh, agriculture is, uh, is about uh, a choice that uh, we should be able to make and just to if I can add a small thing about uh, agroecology or climate smart agriculture or this world are just world and we, you can just pretend what you want with the world so what is important is not the world like uh, even now we're talking about peasant agroecology because agroecology has been uh, used by other people also at uh, the French ministry level. So it's just words. So what we say is that we need to cross criteria. And it's this, uh, the sustainable development goals are very clear on this. Sustainable development is about having a, a pillar on economic aspects, on social aspects, on environmental aspects. You can choose one or another one. It's just you have to add the three. And it's not all economic aspects or social aspects or environmental ones. You just need to cross them and to have clear criteria for each world. So whatever the world is, like it could be a dolphin. <laughs> I mean, if I don't have then criteria, clear criteria, framework and governance and all what we are asking to our states and, uh, and, and to public policies, then we, we won't have anything. So let's not just use empty shells such as uh, climate smart agriculture and make sure that uh, we have a very strong matrix to cross all the elements and make sure we have a sufficient income for peasants, that we have a social aspect that will link uh, the consumption aspects to the production aspects, and that we also have environmental ecosystem integrity, I would say ecosystem integrity above, 
environmental to make sure that our soil are not, are not polluted by, by glyphosate in the name of carbon sequestration, for instance. So these are just put all of that. But this is basically uh, the sustainable goals development, I think, sustainable development goals. Yeah, if I could just comment on the, um, the agroecology CSA question. I really appreciate Anne Laura's comment about you know, words, the words we call things are just words. And um, just, I, I'm certainly not anti-agroecology at all. I'm actually trained as an agroecologist. Um, and I also don't necessarily love the term climate smart agriculture. Um, but I think what I would caution against is sort of a dogmatic approach to the way that adaptation and mitigation should be achieved, particularly um, you know, at the farm level. I think that, to me, the difference between you know, climate smart agriculture and agroecology is one is sort of more focused on the outcomes um, and one is sort of more focused on the methods. And, and I, I do really appreciate the, um, uh, it's the pressure from, from the NGO and civil society world, particularly to sort of question the motives of some of the agribusiness organizations that are involved in the climate smart agriculture movement, because ultimately, you know, their motive is a profit motive. And, um, but that being said, I think while doing that, um, it's important also to, uh, to consider, you know, where there could be good in, in their contribution to climate smart agriculture. I mean, farmers do interact with the private sector, um, both in the North and in the South. And I think working with those organizations sometimes um, can, can lead to beneficial outcomes, the same, you know, outcomes that we're all working towards for farmers to be food secure, to have control over their food system um, and where they obtain their food um, and to have a sustainable livelihood. Um, so, so I would just say, you know, I, I think working in sort of, you know, the climate smart agriculture space, um, I think we would sort of welcome maybe more participation from, from non-governmental organizations and those that, that do question the motives of um, agribusiness organizations and sort of to be working with us while being critical and skeptical rather than necessarily um, throwing the whole, you know, the baby out with the bathwater, if you will. Kelsey, do you have any input on? Well, I mean, so, you know, working on carbon markets, we come at the agriculture sector a bit tangentially. We're not uh, incredibly involved. So I guess the only comment that I could say on climate smart agriculture is the reason that we ever kind of turned an eye towards it um, is because of this concentration on sequestration projects and links, uh, you know, linking back to kind of World Bank, uh, you know, in, incentives to, to eventually link that with carbon markets or, or the FAO also uh, has, has pushed that as well. Um, and and it, this links also to the four per 1000 initiative as well. I mean, we are definitely not against uh, sequestration. We need that to happen. But as was mentioned before, we have 50% of agricultural emissions coming from non-CO2 and 50% coming from CO2. And we don't want the efforts that are going towards sequestration to completely undermine the effort that needs to be happening towards non-CO2 as well. And, you know, we have a long list of very bad uh, carbon credit projects that have happened, I mean, even underneath the UNFCCC system. So um, I think there needs to be a critical eye on the development of some of these initiatives just to make sure that the correct safeguards are in place because as it stands right now, there are, there are no criteria um, and there needs to be, you know, an accountability framework if these, if any types of large scale projects are going to go forward. So I guess it's from that aspect that, that we're watching the process. I think we need to end this now because if we want to leave some time for the next conference to set up, uh, thank you all for your participation and um, we are here for, for you if you have any question uh, outside. <laughs>
no, 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 let me. Uh, I will give you. I have another. I have a copy of it. No, I'm in Vermont, actually. Is it, um, is it Lily? Yes. Yeah. Oh, really? Um, I, 